my wife is just the biggest thrash metal fan. Like 80s thrash metal is starting off with thrash metal. That's amazing. That's oh awesome. man, the other day, um, the other day, one of our friends was was you know selling some records, I guess, you know, because because COVID. Um, and she saw uh peace sales, but who's buying pop up on that list. And I didn't have a chance to get I got peace sales out of my mouth before she said buy it. Uh, we, we're we're big vinyl junkies. So I, I just I want to hear a little bit about what it was like to be in the thrash metal world in the eighties and actually, you know, part of that, a, a big part of that, if you, yeah, if some you don't of those, mind. Yeah, some of the stuff for me to kind of interject a little bit into that as well. Uh, I looked on your website and read some read your bio and did not realize a lot of the stuff that you had been involved in and like opening for Slayer or Anthrax and Testament. And that's really uh, cool. She, yeah, it's really funny because I did not think you guys were going to bring that one up. Oh, man. I, and that, well, that was with the band Mace, right? Yeah. I would be yeah. in my high school band. You know, I, it was like multiple different lineups, but you know, when you're in high school and you get a name and you just think it's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then they were going, why did I, you know, so silly, whatever. But then it was like, you know, you're stuck with it kind of thing. But don't get me started. I can tell you all the, which direction you want me to talk about. It. Uh, man, I just, I want you, if, how much have you gotten to talk about this stuff before? Well, it's it's funny because it's kind of been a um, story of my life, career or whatever, is that I had to do everything at one point to people think I can do something more than thrash metal. And then nobody remembered that I even did that or was even a guitar player. And then I was just stuck with the grunge thing because I worked in grunge records. Or then it was that then I have to show people, no, I, I actually play guitar too. And, you know, so I, and then it would be like, well, you can't really engineer because you were assigned artist in this band because you, you know how it is like at least back in that time like the 90s when i got a record deal with island and polydor it was like nobody would take me for real as a studio guy I was, you're just the writer in the band you're just the guitar player in the band and so i'm always battling these like everyone wants to pigeonhole you into something electronic music somewhere yeah. sampling so i'm always kind of battling that identity thing but it's never been a battle for me internally it's always to other people. I'm glad to hear you say that. Dan and I have had this conversation ad nauseum to his, you know, it's probably annoyed him a lot. But I started out playing guitar. Well, actually, Pearl Jam's 10 that you engineered, but we'll get to that later in the interview, was one of the main, if not the main record that really got me wanting to play guitar. And... So very, very influential for me. So I've played guitar much longer than I've engineered and produced. But most people know me as an engineer and a producer, and I've fought that too. And it's never been an internal struggle. I know what I do well, and I know who I am. They like to know, you know, they have this tunnel kind of vision. They know you for that thing. They want to, which is cool, because if you are known for one thing, you're good at that's That's a cool thing, and you'll get those calls or those recommendations or whatever, but it, it's, it's funny to try to explain that to people over time. As right. I've had that conversation actually yesterday where someone was like, well, I didn't know you played guitar like that. You're good. And I'm like, well, yeah, I've been playing my whole life. And so, with, with you working in electronic music, you, you probably have a, a deeper understanding this than I do. I don't know if Grant told you, I, I'm an English teacher. So I, I work with a lot of, you know, I, I teach comp one and comp two mostly, but I work with a lot of 18, 19 year old students. Well, well you know, to them, the, the studio is the MacBook, but yeah, a producer is the guy who makes beats. Yeah. Yeah. But so many of them, they, they don't even think about, you know, songwriting, producing, and they don't think about those as different things. It's just something you all do on your own to go okay. back to old school and, Hey, here's your lane. Stay in it. That's right. That's really interesting. You brought that up too for me because I had just I just read one of the last projects I did before this whole quarantine shutdown thing was a band from England, and they're all uh, 18 and 19 years old, which I thought was amazing in the first place that there was even a an 18, 90 year old band playing <laughs> rock music. Yeah, right. It's almost it's, extinct. It's rare now, 
And um, I mean, our day, that, or my day at least, that's that's what we were at 18, 19. We were, we were playing instruments and not using a laptop, not using a drum or, or samples or whatever. Yeah, I know. Now they just basically use a program, but I digress. Um, but it, it's interesting to see that, well, at least I had the experience to see that happening again. And kind of the reason why I took the project was it reminded me so much of back when I was growing up. Yeah, the other odd oddity of it, now we even got the project, is because they were fan. You know, they're from um, Hall, England, like kind of a nowhere up north England town, and they're fans of Alice in Chains and you know Stone Temple, everything that was that time period. And I was like, really? You know, so we had our talks and we over the phone did some talking and pre-production. I happened to be in England, so I met them and said I kind of felt like I almost owed it to do it kind of just because this is cool. I haven't seen kids excited in, in a rock band scenario like that so long. And they were England and it was just, I thought, all right, I'm going to do this. So they came over here and we recorded at the vault where I'm working out of now. But yeah, that whole, I'm hoping that keeps going. And I hope maybe that helps inspire some other people, maybe in England, maybe wherever, but to see actual people of that age group and getting in a room together and playing and it was so exciting for me to like, they needed some coaching. And it was like, man, this is great. Cause it, it was like putty. Like I could like, well, you know, this is great. And I like, helped them along and watch that happening. And with this whole home recording thing and all that, some of that is lost. And it was also interesting to see them have the experience of being in a real studio and really, cause it's becoming a, a dying art form for at least rock bands to understand what pre-production is finding the right tempo for a song, working parts out and changing your arrangements. It was like, we never even thought about this part of it. And which, you know, it's endearing and also shocking sometimes, but I hope there's some kind of thing burning somewhere that's going to have a resurgence of that. But at the same time, like I get off on a guy in his bedroom with his Ableton set up and, killing it making a pop song or whatever i mean to me i'm just impressed with that too you know and i'm with you i i think i just like to see you know some of both i don't want to see one totally eclipse the other i agree i agree totally i like seeing the fusion of it actually the music i'm working on right now for my own soul stuff is uh that's what i'm trying to do like i'm using i'm really trying to fuse live and electronic stuff and samples and all those things and uh well, you also, what was the band name, first of all, the English band? November CR. Let's backtrack just a little bit. We kind of derailed from the thrash metal thing. Oh, we didn't even, yeah, that's my bad. So what would you like to say about that? You were, you cool. were in the band Sybil Vane. That was later, but let's start with Mace and the experience you know, that Mace, that is. Mace was like 14, 15-year-old kid in high school, man, getting into like, it was kind of pre-British heavy metal you know, I was oh. still, like, mm-hmm. you, you know, I still into your basics, like everything from ACDC to Boston. I thought it was the best selling record ever. Da, da, da. I was finding my way. Then the new wave of British heavy metal hit me. And I was like, okay. You know, then I was just all in. And then out of kind of stupidity and na- being naive and whatever, I, I just started recording. I started uh, calling up local studios and everything from some guy with the real, the real, four track, eight track to bigger studios in town. And I worked at a record store. I was the record buyer. Well, actually I started there at like 15 and uh, just stocking record and worked there through God, until I was like 20 actually, but worked there. And uh, so I had that side of the record buying the, you know, the retail side of it. And it supported me getting into the studio. You know, all my money was saved every week to get me into the studio time that's how my love for like recording and the actual process of being in a real studio kind of started developing at the same time. I started sending out demos like right away, like just silliness. Like I put them in an envelope handwritten to every label you could imagine and just was audacious about it and ambitious and, and started bands and had different lineups. We played local shows. We put our own shows on. Um, fanzines were a huge thing at the time. So, I just, we just became friends with like every fanzine writer and every, sent demos all around the world from Peru to Japan to you name it, Poland, Germany, everywhere. Did interviews and all that. And we would 
link up with other bands who were doing that. And that's how the idea of touring started. And we were lucky that we got picked up for, so I sent a cassette to Metal Blade Records because, like I said, I was a record buyer at a store. And, I, you know, Metal Blade was putting out that compilation series, Metal Massacre. And he, we, Brian Slagle, the owner of Metal Blade, I one day walked out to the mailbox at my parents' house and this envelope with Metal Blade logo on it was there. And I'm like, oh, you know, open it up. You know, you're accepted via Metal Mask for Five. I was like, holy shit. So I was 17 then. And so that started it all. And then from there, we got opening acts and we started touring. And so it was like, at the time in Seattle or Washington, we really couldn't, it just wasn't cool yet there for us to be playing. Like, we, there's nothing. We do our shows in the outskirts and the suburbs that we put on ourselves. But we discovered, you know, from all the fan scenes, we saw that Berkeley, California was like the epicenter of thrash. So we're like, yeah, we, yeah. Bought, we bought a truck and a trailer and put a canopy that was too big for it. So we froze in the winter because the air would come in. But we would drive to uh, Berkeley and we made friends and started opening for like Possessed, Death Angel, Guys in Exodus, uh, Testament when they were called Legacy at the time. They weren't even Testament yet. Mm-hmm. And just really dove into that scene. And as we were getting more popular in the uh, fanzines and things like that, we were starting, and we were good friends with Metal Church up there. And so that started taking off. Same time, became really good friends because they're from the same town, suburb of Seattle called Everett, with a band called The Accused, who were very punk rock. And they were intrigued by the metal side of things. And we, no pun intended, we bonded over a record called Bonded by Blood called, uh, by Exodus. And we're like, man, and that's where the crossover came. Like, literally, we both groups were going, we need to cross this stuff over. And so then we started playing with DRI, DOA, Circle Jets, every punk band. So we'd go from, we were kind of hated in the metal scene because we were too punk. And then we'd play a punk gig and we were too metal. I love good metal. We were like in the trenches of crossing over, literally. Yeah, metal fans are a lot like bluegrass fans and jazz fans. The, anybody that is so hard, like traditionalists, and there, this is metal. When you deviate, it's like I'm not sure about that. You'll get some hate when you and deviate well, from the. We got a lot of hate for both sides, which then we started. That's interesting. Then we wore it as a badge. Then we were like. Okay, let's piss off as many people as possible. Well, that's the <laughs> most so metal just, thing just, ever. I, and punk. I'd be nervous for my life sometimes. I'm not even exaggerating. And wow. like, the walls of spit that would come towards me or whatever. But we were young and arrogant and didn't care. It was so, we was, loved it anyway because the attempt, it didn't matter. And then we got kind of sloppier. You know, we weren't like technical metal. Even though I studied really hard, I was a good player at the time it became more of an attitude. So we've kind of based our whole thing off this attitude, which now back, the recordings are horrible and all that, which also led me into engineering because then I was realizing, man, I can make this stuff sound better. So Yeah. Well, I want to kind of jump around, but I want to talk about bands you've been a part of or founded before we get into, I'm going to totally nerd out if it's okay on the whole grunge scene. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I'm going to make sure that we talk about things you're doing now in more recent years too. But you also were in, I mentioned Sybil Bain, right? So would you mind talking a little bit about that? That was interesting because at that time period, I'd already started working at Lennon Bridge Studios and I was Rick Rosser's engineer basically in the studio guy there. And, uh, mm-hmm. So I kind of started thinking, you know, this is where I'm going to go. I think I'm going to stay in production now and do that kind of thing. And that being said, there was a lot of things happening, obviously. We were just starting to blow up. Things were really, you know, getting exciting. This was at a, a party, which we didn't have many. We had a few parties at London Bridge, kind of like Sputnik. Sound once in a while. We had one, one of those, and I had met this girl there, April Devereaux, who was the singer, there was a guitar and I just picked it up and started playing something and she sang over it, just like a party vibe, like nothing, this ad lib thing. And then the next day I had people call me, dude, are you working with that girl? Dude? I'm like, you should do something. I'm like, eh, really? What? And I was just very, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even remember, you know, what are you talking about? 
Raj, who was Rick's brother, they their two brothers went on the studio London Bridge. He had called me too and said, Dude, you need to start a band with April. You need to do this. And I'm like, I'm already now in my mindset, I'm cool with being, you know, behind the scenes and doing all this. And so I'm like, all right, you know, so I literally had her come over to my apartment with a four track, Tascam four track, and like laid some things down with her. And with a couple of weeks we were going to like one of the first South by Southwest, maybe the second one or something. I don't know. It was 93 or what I think it was. I'd left one in back before we went there. I'd left it in my car and Rick had borrowed my car to run up to the store or something. He goes, what's in your cassette deck, dude? And so that's the demo. Like, and I thought he was just going to rip me apart because he's like, Rick was very intense, good, you know, amazing engineer, producer, songwriter. I'm like, oh, I don't want him to hear my demos, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, uh, and I go, what? You know, I'm just waiting for him to make fun of it or something. And he's like, it's really good. I'm like, think. And then we went down to South by Southwest with our management at the time, Lipman Entertainment, and got handed out. We came back. I started getting phone calls, like from Epic and all these things. Holy, holy. And so all of a sudden, in the midst of this like thing that was blowing up as an engineer, all of a sudden that happened and I got a record deal. I kind of went on a hiatus from the studio, but yet we ended up doing the record there anyway. Rick ended up producing it and all that. So I was still which was weird too, because here's my boss now, my producer on a record. And it was strange. So we had that, we did that, came out, blah, blah, blah. It was that time when a lot of people were getting signed different things. And we ended, you know, we, we had a chance to go on towards Oasis and the band live when they were really blown up. Like we really got a ton of attention and just radio didn't pick up on it. And next thing you know, we're dropped. So it was like one of those things where it's like, Another reality check, like, you're going to be the biggest star to nobody wants to hear phone calls. And we did a video with Sam Baer, who had just done um, Teen Spirit mm-hmm. on and off. So all the, all, it looked like we had every ace card in the, in the book that was going to be a big deal. And then it was over. So like I say, it was a slap of reality back. And then the man, that was a great band, though. I don't think we made the record. We could have, but you we, can hear what the, the potential of what could have been. For sure. Yeah. Then I just, boom, went back into uh, production. But it was, I, I will say, it was a fun ride. A short one, but while we did it, we got a lot of attention and got to do a lot of things that I would have never expected to do. But Didn't they just recently actually release, re-release or something with that? that, that that's kind of been lost in the, you know, it's one of those things where islands now changed, on, you know. Right, right. And, and it's just kind of a lost record, really. I don't, yes. Nobody yes. really knows who owns it or who owns the right. It's just one oh, of okay. So also moving on from that, and I'm looking on my phone at your bio right now just because I don't want to miss anything and want to make sure we touch on some points. Another band you were a part of in 05, it says you founded, produced, mixed, and engineered the Shoe Gaze Group, the Heavenly Music Association. Would you care to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that was another one that I was um I was really proud of that record. It was purposely kind of lo-fi and all that, but I thought it was great. And we just, we got signed by, we did a single in England on Fierce Panda Records, which is legendary record label from England, kind of like the equivalent of Sub Pop from Seattle, you know? They were like, mm-hmm. thing. very shoegaze kind of stuff, which is this huge fan of that kind of music. And the vocalist from that was in a band called Fluffy. They were a big all-girl rock band from London. They had toured with the Sex Pistols and Marilyn Manson on their big uh, Antichrist tour. So she was kind of a big star in England. Um, not really here, but when we went to England, it was like she was like this big deal. I thought it was a great record. And it was just during that time in the industry, you know, where everything was starting to fall apart, you know, as far as like streaming and like the labels, the studios were closing, labels were, you know, we almost had this big deal with Virgin for a minute. And it's just like, it was right at that time when the labels and everything were just too nervous to do anything or spend any money. Cause that they, sounds familiar. They didn't know the future though. No, that this is like in that cusp, right. When that was kind of happened. Right. So we just didn't get a fair shake, you know, and, and we had a hard time trying to find the right band to put, it was me and her who made the record recorded. It played everything. She played drums on everything. I, I played everything and produced and engineered everything. 
and we tried to put a band around it. It was just one of those things we couldn't quite get it together. And then it just, it see at that period of time, it seemed impossible to get a, a deal or get anything going. So it just unfortunately kind of crashed. <laughs> but I think it was a good record first. I had guest people. I had Dave Cruz from Pearl Jam. Oh, wow. On it. Um, Barty Martin from Count on Bob. It's funny because we had grunge guys play on the shoe mm. record. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Martin, the singer of Cannabox, played drums yeah. on the track. Which That's is, interesting. Right? Who would have thought? And uh, it's funny things like that. It was all because of convenience. They were like around and they're great players and, you know. Good people to have around. And so we like, we needed a partner. Like, hey, would you do this? And, or they liked what we were doing at the time. Me and Kevin had a studio together in Hollywood. And believe it or not, I don't, most people don't know, he started out as a drummer. Similar to Chris Cornell, he started out as a drummer. Mm-hmm. Theory, good singers always start out as a drummer. A and lot so, of them have. Actually, that's a really good point. I started out as a drummer, went I, to guitar. Yeah. Aerosmith, Steven Tyler started out as a drummer. Trey Anastasio of Fish started out as a drummer. A lot of them did. I wonder I if that so. helps with a sense of rhythm. It does. I think it, it. think it's a part of being able to have phrasing, rhythm, timing, yeah. all those kinds of things. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I've noticed that here lately. I'm like, wow, that. Okay, I didn't know he played drums. Let's dive in to Seattle and the grunge era. You worked for London Bridge Studios, chief engineer for what ten years? Is that yeah, right? Between that, I did the. Well, it was like 11 to be exact. And I was kind of freelancing, but I had that period with Sylvain where like I was cut. Okay. Actually working there, but I was there because we booked the studio out for six months for our record deal. <laughs> so yeah, I got you. Got you. As an artist that time, which is strange, but. Well, I have a couple questions in, in regard to that is what years would that have been? 89 to 2000. 2000 is when like I, I did the big move to. Los Angeles when I just said, okay, it's time for me to, you know, they were just, I think the last, I got offered to do uh, with Rick the Nickelback first record and I think one of Brandy Carlisle's first demos. Now, when you say Nickelback's first record, you're not talking about Silver I'm, Side Up. You're talking about the very first one. No, I'm talking about the big one. Oh, Silver uh, Side Up, yeah. Was yeah. it Silver Side Up? Yeah. Okay. Wow. I, okay. I didn't realize that. That's cool. I, uh, That's a I, good record. I down though. <laughs> really it's- well, well, I mean, like, let's just state the obvious here. Everybody cracks fun and makes fun of Nickelback. I know. Dude, that's a good record. Rick makes good records, man. He, makes, he does. He makes good records. It's a good record. I'm 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 willing to go on record here and say Creed, that I, is a good I, album. Every joke, them and Creed, but Hey, whatever. So I'd left at that time because I was making that big stance. Like it was getting to a point where I was just going to be in rich shadow. And da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. It was time for me to make the move. And I was going to LA, man. Let's, you know, I was like, let's do it. And I went down and did a Kevin Martin kind of a solo record, which was a good transition for me because the bills were getting paid and I got to make a record and, and move at the same time. I haven't heard his solo record. I need to listen to that. I love Candlebox, that one record of theirs is freaking amazing. He's a and, good, I, and I love his voice. Underrated singers, dude. He has got a great voice. Let's move back to Seattle for a minute. You mentioned Sub Pop Records, which if anybody knows anything at all about the Seattle movement that was the thing and the grunge scene, Sub Pop was the label, right, that was part of that whole scene. You're working with Rick Parisher. And I hope I'm saying his name correctly. Producer, engineer, writer, co-owner of London Bridge Studios. You're working with other wonderful, world-renowned engineers who've worked on thousands of records like Andy Wallace and so forth. Yeah, right? I've never had direct dealings with those guys. You know, at that time period, you got to remember, so label-oriented. Yeah. Um, that things were being sent places. Like, I didn't... Oh, okay. So you didn't. Wow. Yeah, okay. But, but just to add something real quick on that, not to interrupt, but I mean, that also was a huge pressure for me as a uh, as the engineer because when things left that studio, that was left to me to be sending those things out. And I knew that anytime I sent something out, anybody 
in the world that I admire or whatever might be putting those up on a tape machine one day or whatever. Oh, yeah. That's so, that's a fear as an engineer. Yeah. It's like, oh my God. Pop rock. It could be Andy Wallace. Oh, oh, oh yeah. You, you name it. Well, what was working with before we dive into the to the specific artists and bands you worked with in that area, and and then at time. I mean, that was a pivotal time in musical history, right? You're coming out of glam rock and glam punk, and it's kind of making this shift. What was that like working with producer engineer someone like Rick Parisher at London Bridge, and with in the days where the label situation was more of what we think of as the music industry, not like it is now. What was that like in that day? Because, and I also want to, let me extend that question to not only what was it like in the studio, but what was it like in the clubs and the, and just the whole thing in the area? Because I mean, I imagine it was one of those situations and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like, like it kind of is here in the Shoals or in Nashville, we're just kind of most people just know everybody and they just kind of interweave and work in each other's projects. What was it like in those days? Well, yeah. Okay. There was definitely that. There was definitely a, well, Seattle is, you know, every, as every place has its own unique things. And especially in that time period, you know, everybody, it was like musical chairs for a bit. Like how I look back on it, like I would say like from 87 to 89 ish there, before that whole move, say when 90 hit, there was this people trying to find their sound or a sound or whatever. And I remember, you know, even Alice, for as an example, how they kind of mutated into what they were from a kind of glam based rock thing to a, you know, heavy, slower grunge kind of thing. So there was a lot of like small enough city, it's a big city, small city at the same time, you know? So it was enough to where. You're going to pretty much know anybody and more so from parties. And it was a vibrant time. So everybody was partying. There was after our parties, there was the club we all went to. There was this and that. And everybody was a player. Everybody was something. So you're going to cross paths with everybody. What were some of the clubs that you would go to that, that everybody would kind of gather at? I know here it was uh, for a while, it was DPs in Sheffield, which was a town that's basically Muscle Shoals, but it's Sheffield, and now it's Flo Bama or Laugh, you know, people outside of Alabama, Champies early, Fried Chicken. Early. Everybody kind of has their gathering place. Right. In those early days in particular, I mean, you know how club scenes change. Right. The early days, it was definitely the Vogue. Okay, I've heard definitely of that. Central. I mean, those were like the ones, you know, where you definitely played. And then there was various other Things a little earlier than that was the Gorilla Gardens, it was called. That's where, like, that was earlier. That was pretty, like, that's where everybody was blending and finish. That would be, you know, you could go one night and Sonic used to be playing. They had two rooms, Sonic used to be playing. The other room, uh, 10 Minute Morning with Duff McKagan could be playing. Oh, wow. So it was like, it was that, and that's where May started and all that kind of stuff. Right. So who was, who was hosting the house parties? Oh, God. Every, I mean, is it it everybody or was it just, I mean, there were some key ones, sure, you know, and everybody was, I mean, you just knew everybody, all the girls. I mean, there was just a scene. It was like, you know how the glam metal scene in Hollywood had that moment where it's everywhere? Mm -hmm. Seattle had that moment. It was just, where do you go that night? You could hit a ton of, and then there was just places where people gathered, like the, oh God, I can't even think of the name of it now. It was just a scene, like that whole most classic sense of the word scene. There was Mm -hmm. a and when the labels came, it was just like out of a storybook. All of a sudden, record label people are in quotations there, and they're outside, and they're meeting people, and they're taking them out to dinner, and, da, da, da. and every band got attention somehow. And then they talk about it. Yeah, you know, Columbia guy just took us out to dinner. It was like all those things. Like It was like a, uh, a decline of Western civilization type movie. You know what I mean? It was like you saw that. Right thing happening and it was exciting and so you know it just and when alice was really the first band to get signed in the big sense soundgarden was on sst so they were i mean it was really alice that that did that and then when love love bone got signed that was a real turning point but to go back to where you're the the split in the scene it was also very click orient um so you were kind of in one scene or not you know it was it was very click oriented and and sub pop was like the other side of that. 
you know, they were so indie, indier than now, you know what I mean? But so much creativity and product was coming out every different way, whether it was Tad or Blood Circus or Mud Honey or anything off stuff, off Afghan wigs or whoever. Then there was Mother Love Bone and, you know, Green River and you know, on and on. So it was like, it was just a hotbed. It was just crazy. Cool. Before we dive into bands, let me ask you something about, I'm a huge Cameron Crowe fan. My favorite movie is Almost Famous. I mean, that's just, I can quote that thing. I've probably seen it 50 times. My daughter loves that movie for some reason. She's- I, don't, I don't know. I just, I love it. The movie I'm referring to is Singles. And, you know, that was kind of held as solidifying the Seattle scene to the masses in movie form. And you were involved in the musical aspect with that. Was that like specific songs that were chosen for the film that you had previously worked on records? Or what was your involvement with that? That was all kind of accidental. I was at the time so busy working at the studio. Like that was literally my life. You know, I was many nights. I just didn't go home. I slept on the couch kind of thing. Cause it was too not worth it to drive to go home. That's I had, the studio. Yeah. You know, I was young enough then to do all that. And uh, <laughs> I, didn't even, I just didn't even, I wasn't even paying attention to tell you the truth. I really didn't know that was even going on. I do remember going to one of the film things because I had a like, let's go out one night. And we went to when Alice was shooting that scene in a, a warehouse somewhere down on, uh-huh. on, on the water there, Pierce. But other than that, I didn't know who Cameron Crowe was. I didn't know they were making a big Hollywood movie. Or I, heard, I mean, I kind of did, but I didn't really care. I, who knew? You, know, that's <laughs> you were working. My, you were busy most, working. What's my whole thing with the Seattle scene is at the time, I didn't care in the sense that I was working. I was just doing stuff. Like people were, was it, you know, when he made Pearl Jam, do you think it was going to be record? I don't know, man. I was just making sure it's there on time or waking up and opening the doors for everybody gets there and, you know, putting the coffee on, making sure the mics were there and Rick wasn't going to yell at me for so or an edit or a tape edit that I fell asleep doing and I had to go back and recheck. You know, that's that was my life. It was not, no, it was not glamorous. And, and, it, and the other point too is that what I think is, people don't really understand is that they weren't famous. They were like lo- the guy right. locally famous in a way because of Mother Love Bone and Green River. But I knew them as like we shared rehearsal rooms. I knew them, you know, we all knew the same girl, like all, all that kind of stuff. We were all at the same party. So I didn't when they came in, it wasn't like, oh, you know, big stars are coming in or something. It was just like, oh, here's, you know, let's get to work. You know, yeah. But it was it's like you just doing it. And um, so it wasn't like records I've worked on before worse. And we were in Seattle and Seattle wasn't like, it wasn't like I was working at Capitol Records or, or, or the village or something or electric lady where it had this, you know, 24 hour secretary there. And it's all like high end for real stuff. I, it was just me <laughs> opening the door, you know? And so that part of it. So like back to what you're saying about with singles, I just, didn't know it was going to be some big movie. Like, who knew? At the same time, like, I remember, okay, for instance, I remember when, and this is before the movie is being filmed, I get a call from Rick one day and he says, hey, whatever, tomorrow or the next day, uh, you know, Alice is coming in. They're going to be in there for a day. So, oh, all right, cool, man. And I hadn't seen them in quite a while because they had kind of blew up and been on the road and whatever. I remember the morning I come in and there's these big semi trucks coming in. In the parking lot. What the? Let's go. I'm like, holy cow, what the hell is this? And they're loading in gear and stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And I remember because there was a brand new purple DW drum kit that Sean had got or whatever. And I'm, you know, I go, Rick, what am I doing here? He goes, just set up as we do, you know. And I'm like, okay, do you do a regular setup and all that? And they ended up coming in later in the day and they knocked out wood, like, boom, just like that. One song, recorded it. They did that in one take? It was one, well, I don't know. I, I'm not going to say it was one take, but we did one day. We did that track. They, you know, fucked around with it a little bit. And then that's wait. one of the coolest. That's uh, that the Alice in Chain song. Uh huh. <laughs> it's, it's definitely up there. I agree. Up to me. It was the one that I got to do. Uh, <laughs> one of the, you know, 
And I was like, it was, but it was that simple. Like it was, I mean, you know, Sean comes, you know, it's just your basic band showing up. They're doing, they're checking out the gear. We're getting sound run through it. Rick does his producing thing with him. I'm trying to get sound. Rick's tweaking them too, you know, of course. And they just track it through the night, you know, do the overdubs and all that. And boom, one day we're done. I don't know what it's for. I said, what's this for anyway? The main thing though, was I was so blown away because the last time I'd seen him, there was no semi trucks or anything like that. And like crew and gear, you know, brand new gear being sent to the studio, you know? So I was like, Whoa, things have changed. You know? <laughs> and, uh, it was just done and that's it. So whatever, it's over with. And then, you know, I find, I go, what's it for? And they go, oh, it's a movie. But, you know, then, you know, you know how it is. Movies don't come out for another year or so later or whatever. Yeah. So I didn't know what it was going to be. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing the video on MTV and stuff. And I'm like, damn. Well, it was the same exact way here in Muscle Shoals where uh, until the documentary came out in 2013, there was film crews and there was always somebody like, well, hey, what's that guy doing? Ah, uh, he's working on a documentary. Okay, whatever. Right. I mean, it, it, you were like, well, it probably won't ever come out, you know, whatever. So we kind of, a lot of us just kind of blew it off. And then it ended up being this cool thing that people were like, oh, I didn't know that that was a thing. That's a cool documentary. But, See, but what, the documentary on Seattle would have been more like that because I think it would have been more real. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let me make mention real quick. You mentioned Green River and anybody that knows anything about the Seattle grunge scene, you know, Green River, Mad Season, Nirvana, of course, Pearl Jam, Temple of the Dog, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Mother Love Bone, Blind Melon, Mud Honey. I don't know if I mentioned that again, but let's go to talk about Mother Love Bone because I feel like a lot of that kind of starts there. Let me interject one thing real quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. Season, the funny thing about that is that uh, Sylvain that we talked about earlier we opened Mad Season's second show. Oh, wow. First show. And that is a great record. And that was like one of the funnest, best nights and shows was opening for them because I didn't know what they were doing. I didn't really even know there was a Mad Season or whatever. Oh, wow. Okay. We were kind of like, you got to remember now I'd already been signed and kind of mm-hmm. flying to New York and doing all these things. And all of a sudden I'm back, we're playing Seattle and I know it's Lane and everything. So I'm like, oh, it's good to see Lane, da, da, da. And then I, you know, we played, and then I heard them play, and I, I, I see like you know, line around the block and everything. I'm like, holy cow! This is <laughs> and then Mark Lanigan, who I ended up doing work with later on, mm-hmm. I was saying so. Anyway, I just interject because that was my one mad season moment that I got to be part of. That's cool because I didn't even realize you were involved at all with Mad Season. That's neat. I wasn't, but it, we just, well, I mean, you were, yeah, not not that you worked on their. Yeah. projects but that's cool i didn't know that back to mother love bone you know that was a a thing that kind of came and went way too quick and yeah, we almost in seattle we almost thought like that was gonna be the biggest thing ever and then when it you know when that happened when andy died it was like for you know the carpet just got pulled out from everybody we didn't right think, we didn't think anything was going to recover from that like matter of fact when i started doing the pearl jam demos when we started recording those I remember thinking while I'm in the control room listening and they're, they're running through tracks or, you know, we're recording. I think, well, I remember saying to myself, well, and as a friend, cause I, I love stone and all that. And I'm like, well, at least they had mother love them. Cause I, I thought like <laughs> this Pearl Jam thing, <laughs> they weren't even called that yet. They're Mookie Blayla. I thought, well, it's probably mm-hmm. going to do that well, but you know, <laughs> at least they had, you know, that time with mother love them. Well, it's, it just goes to show sometimes you don't know. And sometimes it just takes a while to kind of develop your thing and figure yeah. out what it is you're doing. Yeah. But Mother Love Bone, I love that song, Chloe and there Crown of Thorns. Right. That is such a good song. That, that's Andy, too. Uh, yes. His swan song. Man, what a, what a voice. So you were, what, assistant engineer on that? Correct? Yeah. I can, Well... They had, so, yes, basically that was kind of me getting uh, broken in, in a way. Like, they were signed, and Rick wasn't even producing that. So they had their own, I forget his name, Rob. Right. Can't remember his name right now. So I was basically the jack of all trades, dude, making sure some shit, or things like that. So, and it was weird, too, because, like I, like I said, I'd already known all of them just from, uh, you know, the other dudes in town, the other players. You know, so it was exciting to see, and it gave me a chance to... Uh, 
see the workings of a real record being made on a budget and at the place, you know, the place where I'm supposed to be and, you know, getting, getting trust from, you know, the owners, Rick and Raj and things like that. That led to Temple of the Dog as a memorial record of sorts. That was really before Pearl Jam was really kind of doing their thing. Yeah, they weren't and really, yeah. Today yeah. is May 19th, which yesterday... And feel free to talk or not talk about this, but th- yesterday was three year anniversary that Chris Cornell passed away, which just sucks. I mean, there's no other way to describe that. Would you? I guess my question is, man, I know Eddie Vedder and everybody was still kind of coming into their own, but Chris Cornell had kind of he already had his voice at yeah, that point. Be- and oh, yeah. and how was it working with? I mean, I. You go down the list with Shannon Hoon of Blind Melon, you know, the whole Jerry Cantrell, and uh, forgive me, I'm, his name's leaving me, Allison Chains. How about Lane Staley? Yes, Lane Staley. Thank you, Dan. Of course, Eddie Vedder and Andy Wood and Chris Cornell. I mean, you've worked with some of the biggest powerhouse singer vocalists, not just good singers, but a personality that all of them, other singers pattern themselves after. What was working with that like? Why couldn't I have gotten one of them in my band? (laughs) 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 Myself. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, that's a great question. Interesting, because let me preface it with something else, but don't let me forget to go back to uh, when I was working on on SAP, the Alice EP, because I got a chance to have a numerous of them in the same place at the same time. That was quite interesting. But I guess with, well, first of all, Chris, I didn't know as well. He was a little more, I don't want to say to himself. I I don't know. He wasn't like he wasn't friendly or anything. Super nice guy. Always like a smile and a handshake and everything's cool and would kind of hang with you a bit, but he didn't talk a lot. Let's put it that way. He didn't like, like where Wayne, I knew really well. Andy was just a riot. Like he was a circus the whole time you're with him. It's just, you're just laughing and you can't help but be friends with him. My favorite two things with Andy is go, I went to a Wasp concert with him and I went to a Danzig concert <laughs> with him. Oh, and wow. Danzig. Yeah. My, just thinking about it, my face hurts of how much I laugh. Like he's just so funny the whole time. So, you know, there's, there was a lot of personal, and, Sh- and Shannon Hoon and me hit it off like wildfire, too, like, too scary. Like, us together for too long was danger. We, yeah. that, that was a loss to the music world for sure. Man, I love his voice. Fun, dude, what yeah. did you, real quick, what did you work with on with Blind Melon? I really did. Here's what happened with Blind Melon is that I didn't work on the record. That was John Plum and, and Rick. John is the other engineer at London Bridge, and as my stuff was moving on like the Sylvain and stuff, he, he had took over and got to do all the other great records with Rick and is now the owner of uh, Lennon Bridge. Good for him. With them, I just, I ended up knowing them because they were in town and I was all to be at the studio anyway. Okay. I had a little room upstairs. I would do, you know, I was there. So we just became friends. And then later on, and then I did some recording with Rogers, one of the guitar players, he played him some stuff that I was doing, and then Shannon wanted to do some solo stuff because he was mad at the band. Those guys are so funny, dude. They had so much band drama. It was hilarious. In a good way. We do stuff, and Chris, it just became friends with them all. And then they, Christopher and Brad, guitar player and bass player, opened a studio in Los Angeles. And that's when I started working down in Los Angeles. So I go, perfect. And so I started doing projects out of their place. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. So, Back to uh, with Chris is so I would see, you know, he'd be at some different parties, you know, London Bridge thing and stuff. And it was always cool hanging with him. And like the nicest gentleman, like just cool ass dude. Plus, oh, let me go back on this one. Back to Mace. So Mace had come back from San Francisco on a show and we hadn't been in Seattle. We were pre- feeling pretty good about ourselves because we were playing all the cool places in, in Frisco, the Stone, Berkeley. And, doing all the cool thrash metal stuff. And we had a gig on our arrival home at a little tiny place under the monorail. I don't know if you guys know about Seattle, but there's this thing called the monorail that's mm-hmm. part of 
these space needle thing mm-hmm. world's fair and it was called the ditto and the band opening for us was this band called Soundgarden. <laughs> so Soundgarden opened for you so they, guys. This That's is awesome. Started out. So they're playing the smallest club you could ever imagine. This little dive bar, no stage, nothing. And I see Cornell, I don't know him yet. I see Cornell come out and he's literally got an SM7, no shirt, of course, no shirt or nothing. He's got an SM7 literally down his, in his mouth inside his mouth going what you know his singing because i think they are recording working on that screaming lot the first record and it was just like what and i'm like and he's and he had uh shorts and and doc martens and he's stomping like a caveman and <laughs> i'm like Who the hell is this like i was just like flabbergasted like that guy is a monster then no, no thoughts for a couple of years or whatever until later on. And then and then I remember seeing him at an early sound garden when they started blowing up, I think with Jane's Addiction or something, and he came out and stayed. But this guy is just freaking Godzilla on stage. <laughs> man, what a what a voice, man. Not only man. that presence when he'd walk. Yes. Out. 